All right. Hey there, it's Bram Kanstein, and this is Bitcoin for Millennials. If you enjoy this episode, please consider giving a thumbs up and subscribing on YouTube or your favorite podcasting app. This will help me reach a wider audience and educate more millennials on Bitcoin together with my guests. And in this episode, I'm joined by Vivian, aka BTC Viv. She's a passionate Bitcoin advocate who elevates Bitcoin companies through marketing and PR. And she's also the producer and host of Life with Bitcoin, a podcast on the personal transformations through the lens of Bitcoin, asking the very question, what is it like to live as a Bitcoiner? We discuss Bitcoin's impact on personal growth, the power of taking responsibility, Bitcoin's role in spiritual exploration, how Bitcoin fosters community and the importance of unlearning personal limitations. I hope you enjoy this episode. All right, BTC Fifth, welcome to Bitcoin for Millennials. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on. I uh, I love that uh, you also have a Bitcoin podcast. We will definitely talk about that. Uh, very cool that you're also contributing to the space. So I'm uh, super excited to talk with you today. But first, I, I wanted to start with your Bitcoin journey. How did you discover Bitcoin and how has your perspective changed over time? Of course, and I like most people that come to Bitcoin, become a Bitcoiner and I want to get a Bitcoin job. It was actually the other way around for me. So before I became a Bitcoiner and have any experience or knowledge to Bitcoin, I um, I found myself in a Bitcoin gig. At the time I was doing my master's degree uh, in London during a lockdown, uh, it was during COVID. So uh, there was not much to do outside of schoolwork. So I continued my freelance practice uh, throughout the program, doing marketing and communications uh, PR freelance through uh, various clients that I found online here and there. And then I stumbled upon a Bitcoin project. It was a marketing and PR project for um, European uh, security token company. So it was still around blockchain, although I had really no knowledge about blockchain either. So I had a mm. steep learning curve, understanding what is blockchain, what is Bitcoin, um, and marketing is something you really have to understand what you're talking about to do a good job. So I took the initiative to understand, trying to understand what this thing is. And once I got the sense, I realized what Bitcoin means for personal freedom. Then for me, there's no turning back. Like that's where I gained uh, the real conviction because I'm, I've always been a freedom maximalist. Um, I always felt guilty growing up as the only child in the family, like watching news to the point that I would actually avoid watching news because there's so many devastating news happening all around the world. And I thought all of these children that don't have clean water or electricity. And I asked myself, like, what's my, what's the difference between me and them? It's, it's that I got lucky that I was born into this family and receive all the love and support but they didn't have that privilege. They didn't have that opportunity for a lot of the stuff I have access to. So I experienced that guilt growing up um, and I just tune out of reality uh, in, in a way, like kind of dive into things like art and music and books and just try to live in my own world so that I, I don't have to feel guilty 24 seven. And once I discovered Bitcoin in the sense that how a place how it acts as a thing to really leveling the playing ground for everyone to have something, a solid money to save, a saving device, store value people can really fall back on and to free up their energy and time to chase their freedom, to chase their happiness and become whoever they're supposed to be. That for me, it's so valuable. And I want to contribute in a community that I help bring awareness to other people showing that you have options and this is how you can opt out from the system. So um, the real conviction really gained from the, the freedom aspect um, in Bitcoin. But yeah, I got a Bitcoin job before I became a Bitcoiner and Fun. I will I will be eternally grateful for that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that angle. I, I think a lot of people would end up um, to that dimension of Bitcoin perhaps after being interested in price or the technology or, you know, stuff like that. Very cool that that was your first approach. Yeah, I, it's funny. I'm also um, an only child. And although I did not feel the guilt, I do know that I also always thought like, okay, I, 
I am pretty lucky, you know, that, that, um, uh, and, and I also try to instill that in my own child. Like there's people that, that do not have it like us, right. And we are just randomly born here and, 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 and we are very lucky. And I think once you make that bigger, you know, uh, especially if you grow up, I think in a Western society that a lot of Western countries, um, abused other countries right and and still do also true through the money you know and uh and getting to a fairer money uh is a, is a very big mission right but uh yeah how how do you see that how big do you think bitcoin is um it's, it's really on the same level of humanity like it really acts like a the vehicle to empower humanity because if you think about it, we as individuals, we are, we're, we're, we're brought to this world and meant to be our, our own person, meant to be, meant to discover our, our own potential. But our environment is actually not allowing us to do that. And we, everybody being the subject of our environment, if we're always on survival mode and we cannot have the opportunity to even step out of the survival mode, there's very little we can think about um on top of that because we only have so much time we only have so much energy and what's devastating for me how fiat system works is how it hinders individual for becoming themselves finding their true path and walk that path and i've always thought bitcoin is is the means to an end but it's not the end and we as humans, we long for connections. We long for freedom and happiness and, um, the sense of fulfillment, purpose, community, like those things we all long for as humans. And it doesn't matter where we're from. It doesn't matter what race we are, what gender we are, uh, where, where we are born, where, where we're living. Like as long as we're humans, we share those things, um, as a species and Bitcoin on the collective level can help us move closer to that. It is a vehicle for us to move closer to freedom and happiness, but it's not freedom and happiness itself. And it's sad to see how some big winners kind of mistaken the two and would hope that, oh, if I stack sets, then all of my life problems will go away. But just like you cannot rely on any one thing or any one person to kind of save your life, you have to kind of walk that path yourself. Um, so this is something that I try to remind myself and I hear repeatedly from my guests on, on um, my podcast that this is how they've dealt with their life. It's that big, having Bitcoin is not enough. Like no matter how much Bitcoin you have, it's, it's not enough. It's up to you to think about what are you doing with your Bitcoin and without your Bitcoin, um, how, how are you spending your time and energy? And I think these fundamentally will be, continue to be the most important thing we um, navigate in this life as, as, as people in general. Yeah. Well, it's, it's that sentence of the, the fiat money, uh, you know, the inflation of fiat money or the debasement of fiat money that, uh, steals your time. Right. And if, if you get your time back by adopting the best money to ever exist, then you actually have the, the space to explore. Why am I here? What, what am I here to add? You know, what am I here to do? And, um, yeah, it's not the end, right? It's actually the beginning or like a new beginning. I, I had a conversation today, also, also yesterday about the same topic, right? Like, could you plan today to build some massive new building, right? That would take like 50 or 80 years to build, you know, like, like there have been in the past, you know, like people that built a building and never saw the completion of the building or the usage of the building or the joy of the people visiting the building, right? And nowadays that is just incomprehensible to even think about that, you know, with the um, debasement of the money that should pay for such a construction, how can we even attain, try to attain something as big as that, right? Or find the best people that could be the carpenter or could be the mason or the, you know, and yeah, I, I just, I just love that dimension because it is a beginning, right? It is a new beginning to, to build again. It is. And, and I guess through Bitcoin or through my few years working in Bitcoin and 
coming coming back to reality again because because now you have to understand what what's going on in the world to really do my job in a way and bitcoin changed me in the sense that i'm turning my head back to reality again knowing that i i need to know this because now i can make a difference um very cool now i think about privilege in this way if you're in a privileged position there there are two things I would say. The first thing is don't abuse it. Um, now we see it. People, people who are in fortunate positions or privileged positions even, or position with power. And then if you're not careful with it, you actually can end up abusing it. So the first thing is actually try really, really hard and discipline yourself. If you're in such position, don't abuse your power. And then the second is to, if you're actually in the privileged, privileged positions and you are one of those people who do feel guilty about it, um, don't. Don't feel guilty about it. Instead, channel that guilty energy to something more productive. Use your privilege to help other people. Use your privilege to um, spread the world, spread the awareness of something you believe, and that can be uh, that can help people who are in less less fortunate positions, such as Bitcoin. And because if you feel guilty and then you don't use the privilege, there's it's it's a lose lose situation because not only you cannot use something that you are not entitled but it's available to you that you can use to benefit yourself benefit others not only you're not tapping into that resource but you are depressed like uh, guilt guilt is a very low frequency uh energy like it's a very low frequency emotion and it's actually worse than sadness like guilt as an emotion is more harmful to our body, yeah. to our mind, than sadness and depression. Um, so don't be, don't feel guilty, but channel that energy into something more positive, more productive. Use that privilege to help others so we can, um, elevate humanity together, no matter where you are to start with, right? Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet. I've been using mine for about a year now, and I love the design and ease of use. And with Foundation's mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app or any of your other favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a micro SD card and is built with 100% open source hardware and software. I love what Zach and the team at Foundation are building. And to learn more about their mission, please check out episode 27 of this podcast. If you consider buying a Foundation Passport, you can use code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, to get $10 off at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. Yeah, it's, uh, um, I just realized n not so long ago that uh, I was also really privileged to figure out Bitcoin, you know, to have the time or be able to create the time to to study Bitcoin. And I think trying to contribute like, like we are trying to do in, in our own way is kind of like applying what you just said, you know, trying to share this message of a better money and, and all the things that it could bring just because we, we are able to, you know, and I, I, I slowly come to realize that even the people that experience the problem of debasing money in like, countries that are way less developed than our countries, you know, they don't have the time to study Bitcoin, right? Or they don't, they, they need the help. I'm not saying that we maybe directly reach them, right? But just the general message or kind of like, um, 
how do you say, like the evangelism of Bitcoin, right? That is kind of using your privilege in a sense. Yeah, totally. I guess in the end, it's, it's, we, we serve as touch points, right? Cause we, in a, mm. in a Bitcoiners journey, um, I talked to Natalie Brunel and she said something that everybody, everyone is against Bitcoin before they're for Bitcoin. And that's true. Yeah. And along <laughs> that journey from against Bitcoin to for Bitcoin, there's a lot of touch points, um, that yes. they go through. Either that's, um, like either that's through mere exposure to see a Bitcoin sign in a local shop or uh, talking to someone at farmer's market who do accept Bitcoin and then you just kind of laugh at them. Like this is magic internet money or you're, you're receiving doesn't yeah. make any sense. And then like later on you meet someone else and they're, Oh, do you take Bitcoin? Can I pay you in Bitcoin? And then these things eventually add up. Combined yep. with the socioeconomics, uh, whatever happens in our society, combined with whatever Bitcoin price is at the time, wherever we are in the market, then they all kind of add up in an exponential thing to the, to the point where they move, nudge them kind of to the rabbit hole. And then when they, they jump. So yeah. I consider myself providing these touch points without knowing. Um, and I think it's, it's, I, I'm a big believer in karma and I think this is, there's a lot of good karma for Bitcoiners who are actively spreading the message, but yeah. don't get upset when people don't listen because maybe you're just, you, maybe you're just reaching them at the beginning of their journey. And of course you're going to encounter the nat natural resistance, but just understand that everybody has to work, walk that journey. You can't walk it for them and you walk that yourself. That's why you gain conviction to this extent as a Bitcoiner, um, help them at their level and don't get upset or frustrated or try not to, right? Cause I, cause I get it. I get frustrated when people just, just don't get it. And I care about them. Um, but yes. it's, it's awareness to regulate our own emotions. Don't get frustrated, serve as a touch point. You don't have to do all the work because we're all here in this together. Yeah. Yeah. I, I also really love the idea of touch points and also you, you never know who you reach with your own efforts, right? And you also don't know what triggers them into becoming curious enough to study more or, you know, a certain dimension of Bitcoin or whatever, like going deeper down that, that path of, of acquiring knowledge, you know? So. I, uh, I assume you also get messages or tweets from people that are like, oh, that was really interesting what you, what you talked about, right? And I think that is also the fun in it, no? Like that's already so rewarding that you somewhere touched someone that continued on this journey of, yeah, understanding money and then Bitcoin and, 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 and all these things. And there's already so much, uh, so much joy in that, just that, you know? Uh, yeah. At, at least, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, definitely. Um, I was having this conversation with Roger and I thousand on the, the, the podcast and he, he, he's one of my guests, a musician, chocolate maker, and he shared the story where he actually lost 80% of his Bitcoin. And with, but wow. after that, he came to understand how losing his Bitcoin, it's such a purifying process for him and mm. before he could be like oh this this can go to xyz and then i can have this and that and then after he lost it it's, it's just okay so i'm now i'm willing to give up all of my bitcoin to do what i love and i think this is where every bitcoiner should get there like every bit bitcoiner should be able to get there mentally um to really be free because the end of the day think about the freedom and the joy we can get from doing what our, what we love for a lifetime. It's then it doesn't, it's not even necessarily about Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin certainly empowers that, but it's not about Bitcoin at the end of the day. Yes. And that story, it's so empowering for me. Like now I'm more comfortable spending my Bitcoin. Um, now I'm more comfortable with even more comfortable with just don't care about the price at all. Um, and really have that peace of mind to channel more of my energy to do what I love, um, which is be curious about people and un un uncovering their story. And I'm already learning so much from my own guests. And, and those are the, my own limitations and my own struggles that I ask them. Um, so in a way, the life with Bitcoiners themselves itself is enough, like with or without Bitcoin. 
of course, we want to have Bitcoin. It's never technically enough, but the life with living with Bitcoiners in my life and we create together, we create connections and do things together. Um, yeah. It's enough in a way for me. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So on this learning path, what do you think is the main thing people need to learn and the main thing people need to unlearn before they can understand Bitcoin? Mm, what people need to learn or what I need to learn in, in that case is to really take responsibility of my life. I think it's it's the, the personal sovereignty and agency and uh, responsibility is the first step. Because if you are outsourcing all those responsibilities to any parties, can be your parents, it can be your wife, your kids, or your boss, or your state. Um, if you're outsourcing, how are you spending your time? How are you spending your energy to anyone else that's not you? Then you're in trouble. And yes. most of, in our generation, we have identity crisis. We have existential crisis. And some like, I feel like I had a midlife crisis in my twenties. And that's because I'm now I'm, I'm understanding, like asking the fundamental question of who I am and what do I want to do with my time? And it's, it can be extremely intimidating when you're asking this question to yourself for the first time. And it's, Oh, it's also really scary to realize that for what, however long that you weren't actually making that decision actively, you're getting pushed, um, here and there, going to school and do this job because this is the only job you can get sort of thing. And you're, you're in this rabbit in, you're in this rabbit hole of a rat race. There's no ending of this. So it's a rabbit hole of the rat race too. Um, this, the, you're, you're operating so much on autopilot and is so reactive. Um, and that kind of go back to the survival mode because we p kind of have to. And especially in whatever situation, if you need a roof, if you need to provide for your family, these are the things you have to do. And it's very honorable to be able to fulfill these responsibilities for others and for society. But at the end of the day, we're our own person and we want to look inwards and ask ourselves all these fundamental questions we ask ourselves for thousands and millions of years. Like, who are we? Where are we come yeah. from? Where are we going? And yes. if you don't have the, the means or don't take responsibilities at all of your own time, your own life and your energy, there's no way you can beginning to uncover this very question. So taking personal responsibilities and claiming that sovereignty back, it's, I would say it's the first, is the prerequisite of really becoming Bitcoiners because we, I'm sure you can relate to this. We try to spread the knowledge and we try to um, onboard people with more knowledge or fundamentals of how this is how Bitcoin works. And some people don't really subscribe to that. And it's not a, it's not a IQ thing because there's so many materials out there can break down Bitcoin in a very simple and digestible way. But why people are not listening is by adapting Bitcoin, you're actually actively claiming the, the responsibility yes. and sovereignty. And people don't, some people don't want to do that. Some, it's extremely yeah. scary to having to self custody your life saving. <laughs> like I mm -hmm. still feel that pain very real. And every time I have to send a transaction between Koala, I'm like, oh, it's, it's really natural to feel scared, but you just have to push against it and want to have, want to live freely more than the the fear of dealing with the discomfort of doing something that's different yeah well a lot of things converge there right like just conscious decision making in general yeah. right and realizing as you said you know when i was 23 where was i like where was my head at what like how the, the fact that you now consciously think about where was i when i was 23 i've had these moments also right and you're like i don't know I don't even know how I survived to 36. You know, I, I, I really don't know. And I think that is already one thing you just need to accept. Like you cannot get that back, right? Okay. That was apparently, I, I was so, um, living not, not in a conscious way. Right. So that's already one, I think. And that's also the not seeing yourself as a failure or whatever, feeling bad for yourself. It's just, what it is right but once you make that decision okay i'm going to make conscious choices in my life and 
once you realize that you never did that before, that's already pretty big. <laughs> you know, th just that decision is really big and also very scary. And yeah, what you said about the self custody, I think it is another thing. Once you realize that, I love that you said outsourced. I say the same word all, uh, all the time. Uh, once you realize that you outsourced like 80% of the most important things in your life for other people to deal with for you. And these people do not care about your individual needs or wants or wishes or problems, all these things, not because they are malicious, but just because they care more about their own, you know, it's just a job for them to work at a bank or something like that. That I, I think that is kind of like the eye opening moment when you, when you realize that and you're like, okay, <laughs> really, there's no one coming to save me. Wow. Okay. You know, uh, do I follow this path or do I stay, uh, you know, the matrix example of uh, keep eating the steak in the matrix that for, like, like that, that is that. And then you're not even at Bitcoin yet, right? You're yeah. not even at the solution of how it could set you free or, or, or give you more sovereignty again. You're just in, in the phase before that. Totally. And this, the thing I would say that I needed to unlearn is it's not something that's, that's knowledge. Um, from from the knowledge perspective because i i'm not someone i wasn't someone who was particularly savvy on economics or technology and these are and then the, for early adopters of bitcoin they're either it's likely they're either interested in economics or technology so for them they had to unlearn whatever they knew about um maybe economics um or or technology to to come to our understanding to learn make space for the bitcoin knowledge again but for me because i didn't have these prerequisites um it's actually relatively easy for me to to understand bitcoin as long as i have the right materials to break it down properly and break it down yeah. enough without jargons and make it like a five, five year old five year old uh, kind of cartoon ish um explainers but what I had to unlearn is this mental limitation that I had previous to coming into Bitcoin is that, oh, it's, it's not for me because I'm not technical enough. It's not for me because this is, I just, I don't see myself having any similarity or commonality with this. So I'm just not going to be bothered. It's this mental limitation that I project onto myself that I have to, to break down. And now I can understand Bitcoin. I'm not a, good explainer of what it is still that's why i'm i i avoid talking on technical issues uh, but i understand how it functions i understand the the most important aspect of it i understand the philosophy around it or some of it that i can deeply resonate with but i'm not a technical person i can still do that it's the understanding of i can do this even if i'm not xyz it's a very freeing aspect is a really freeing perspective that I'm adapting this into other areas of my life beyond Bitcoin. If I catch myself doubting myself, oh, I can't do this because of X, Y, Z, I immediately catch myself now saying, oh, you thought about that in about Bitcoin and you thought about that about other things and you were wrong and you're actually actively working in the space. You're doing tons of things and you could actually do this if you make the decision that you want to and actually go after it with your actions. Yeah. And this is very, this is a very empowering mentality that I acquired through Bitcoin and through kind of different adventures I've gone on um, because of Bitcoin that it's really helping me in other areas in my life. Yeah, absolutely love that. I think that is what Tomer Strolai talks about, right? Uh, maybe the more spiritual journey or the self-discovery journey, you know, that's connected with Bitcoin. I absolutely agree. My reflection on that is that I think it comes from once you overcome your resistance to Bitcoin in whatever way, right? And you study it and you verify all the things yourself, then you get to a point where you understand that you can actually trust yourself for doing the work the subject that is Bitcoin, right? But exactly as you said, you can apply that to any any other thing, just the realization that you can trust yourself. You do not have to listen to other people. You can do your own research. You can challenge yourself. You can talk with others, let them challenge you, whatever, reflect with others, right? 
And then you end up to a point where you see Bitcoin and it's just, it, and, and I think the realization is, but let me check with you. You see that other people end up at the same point, right? At the same point of understanding and conviction and enthusiasm and like drive to contribute to it, right? And so that shows that, that you did, um, the work. Like you can do that too, right? You can challenge yourself and eventually trust yourself in your own judgment and your own work. And that permeates to, yeah, any other thing. And, and that's the beauty of proof of work, because when we talk about proof of work, we don't talk about doubts. We talk about how much work you've done and how much, like how much it shows, right? And then we don't talk about doubt when we talk about proof of work. What does it mean? It means sometimes when you're in doubt, and we are all, we are, we all doubt ourselves. Like, believe it or not, we all doubt ourselves. We have imposter syndrome, left, right, and center. We're in, you know, all industries, all life stages. But the trick here is that even if we're in doubt, we still have to keep going because that's the beauty of proof of work. If you're in doubt, don't stop, just work through it. Yeah. And then let the proof of work prove itself. Um, if you kind of in doubt and then you just, feel doubtful and then just sit on it it's first not productive it kind of goes back to the guilt thing where you not only not being productive and you're torturing self with these negative emotions that doesn't translate into anything fruitful and that's that's yeah. a really bad place to be um so let the proof of work speak it to speak to itself push push through those moments of imposter syndrome and um yeah like under, knowing that there are other people are, are just like us, um, living through this stacking sets and trying to contribute in however way they can, a big or small. And there's no wasted effort. And every single message we send to spread the message or, or moving towards where we are trying to go, that incremental effort will really accumulate, but they may not be obvious at first. So we just need to be consistent, be patient, and then just do the work, um, regardless of how we feel motivated today, where or not, or really wanted to um, yeah. give it all up, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very, very good explainer, I think. Uh... I think that that uh, connects with a lot of people, actually. You know, I, I also think that once you do the work, but you had resistance before, you know, like once you understand the principle of, I want to attain something, but it's hard. So you feel resistance, right? Or I want to understand something, but it's hard. I feel resistance. Like once you understand the principle of going against the resistance and just doing it, that the reward is always way bigger and, and a way better feeling than just, you know, sitting on the couch doing nothing and just only thinking about the resistance that you have, right? Oh, it's hard or difficult or whatever. Um, I love that. I love that. Yeah. I, I do want to challenge you. Yeah. yeah. It, what, before you challenge me, I want to say one thing. Um, one, one example to that, one story related to that is um, I used to be very, um, I used to hate like walking uphill just on the road in general. Cause I'm from someone, I'm from somewhere who's like really f flat. And then when I go yeah. to places like San Francisco, we're just hilly in general. And then if, especially if, if I have a bicycle and I have to like ride uphill, I would feel immediately grumpy. It would actually <laughs> irritates me so much to the point that I would feel my blood pressure start to rise, um, to an uncomfortable state. And last year I challenged myself to get rid of that discomfort. So what I did was every time I go to the gym, I would walk uphill for like the incline, like do it to the max and walk 40 straight minutes. And I get faster and faster and faster and just get used to walking for like 40 straight minutes. And to the point now, I don't feel there's a hell at all. I don't feel there's a hell at all. I kind of snip through all of the uphills that I come across, like walking nice. really fast. And then the, the, flat ground just feels downhill for me. So it, everything gets easier. <laughs> everything gets easier now. I don't get grumpy anymore. So the essence of the story is that if we don't train our muscle to deal with these uncomfortable situations, then our muscle actually shrinks. And then everything 
that we used to think it was manageable will become difficult just because our own capability shrinks. So to challenge ourselves to power through this uphill moment, I guess, will intrinsically make everything, make every step you take easier in the end. Love that. That's a great, great, great example. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wanted to challenge you because you said I'm not really good at explaining. Actually, I wrote down if someone asks <laughs> you what is Bitcoin and why should I care? W- what is your go to answer? How do you explain it? Oh, um, I would say Bitcoin is a freedom technology. Um, it's um, it's a form of sound money that have fixed supply. Um, and it will only be so much Bitcoin and it will be mined around the last Bitcoin will be mined around 2140. I will actually give that specific, um, to, to show that it's a real thing. And after that, there's no more Bitcoin and, um, it's a store of value. It's a real store of value because there's all, there's real scarcity. And if, if when, um, and then I can go into a little bit of how, like, how it compares to gold, because oftentimes people will start a question like gold is scarce, but why not gold? Um, and then the end, I would, towards the end, I would end with a chart of this is Bitcoin prize in the past 10 years, five years, 15 years. And I'll just stop there. And then I'll walk away, basically change subject of the discussion. <laughs> and that's how yeah. I would, I would, I wouldn't do it no more than two minutes and end with the chart and then just stop there. And I, oh, the last thing I would say is that don't buy Bitcoin if you don't plan to hold it for at least two years. I don't say four mm. years because I feel like four years is such a big commitment. If they can, I feel like if they can commit for two years, they will be able to commit four years just because in that two years, their whole life is going to change. Um, so yeah. I would say that don't buy Bitcoin if you're not ready to hold it, huddle it for, for two years. Um, so I actually go against telling them go buy Bitcoin. I actually say don't buy Bitcoin unless you're ready to to hold for two years and why you should right. hold for two years. And these are the resources why you should find out. And I leave with like a little bit of a, a emotional trigger, like regardless of what happens 10 years down the line, you will remember this conversation because either you buy Bitcoin and then you will benefit from it or you you don't. And then you will be like kicking yourself and one like kicking yourself thinking, oh, I should have listened to her. And I would live better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think the psychological tricks work work well, right? So how do you experience talking about Bitcoin with your generational peers? How how does that go? Is it rewarding? Are you still trying to get them into Bitcoin or how how does it go? Right. Um I have my like my friends, if they are not actively if they're not active Bitcoiners, they have some Bitcoin. So they they kind of know that this is a thing and it's they're they're distributing maybe 5%, 10% of their portfolio into bitcoin and i think that's that's good because over time they can see how bitcoin compared to other assets they're they're actively investing in and the proof will speak itself um and they know that i'm heavily involved in the space so whenever they have a question they know that I'm, I would be the person to, that might have a good enough answer. Um, I think that's enough. I don't actively try to push agenda onto my friends. I think everybody works their own, walk their own journey. Um, I just hope that I can be the one who can help them when they do need that extra push or do need extra resources to know where to get started or go further. Yeah. And with your parents? Interestingly, um, uh, so I work in, uh, I've been working in Bitcoin for the past three and a half years. And what happened is that they obviously know that I'm, I'm a Bitcoiner and I, um, I work in Bitcoin. So they, they knew that I work in Bitcoin. So they, and they didn't know that I was a Bitcoiner until maybe a few months ago. So, um, mm. my dad would tell me before, oh, like twice a year, maybe twice a year, they would casually say, oh, do you, do you consider, to go do something else, like change another career with something. Are you, wh- what are you doing? Are, is it actually legal? Like, are you sure you'll be fine? <laughs> are you paying your taxes? And they're, they're telling, they're saying these things. And then my dad would even say, Oh, like you work in this industry. That's fine. It seems like a, uh, it seems like an industry that's growing, but don't you dare buy any Bitcoin. 
and I would, I would be before I would be like, yeah, sure, dad. Um, I, I hear you, but of course that's not, mm-hmm. that's not the case, but I just want to, like, I don't want to project all the information onto them when they're not ready. Like I want it to be an infiltration process where they come to turn themselves. Um, yeah. and then the past six, they, they literally just left last week. So they've been spending six weeks, um, here where, where uh, in where I am, like visiting me. And because, um, I work and live in uh, on Bitcoin and they, we, and we talk about work and they are starting to understand, okay, so these people that they also know are into Bitcoin and halo effect in this case is real because we talk about, oh, Donald Trump going to Bitcoin conference. It's, it's like people, some people question the validity of that. Some people question is that really good for Bitcoin? I'm telling you, Halo Effect is 100% real because for, for people like my parents, they don't know Michael Saylor. They don't know people that we respect and listen to in, in the, in the Bitcoin community, but they know Elon Musk. They know Donald Trump and they know all these people that are on the global stage playing a role. And if these people are, are tuning into Bitcoin, paying attention and actively addressing this, then in their eyes, it's like, okay, so now Bitcoin have become important enough issue for people that I know to talk about and to pay attention, to care about. So maybe I should look into it too. And the other day um, in on, on at lunch and I was telling my dad, like this is a similar kind of psychological trick. I'm like, do you really think you are smarter than all these people on Bitcoin? And he didn't say anything. But I saw his eyes flickered. So I, I, fe- I felt <laughs> like I triggered him, but I'm not going to call yeah. him out. Um, and then I bought my parents uh, the Bitcoin standard, the Chinese version of Bitcoin standard, and they just came through through the mail. And then I gave it to my dad and he was actually like reading it. I've never seen my dad read oh, one cool. book in my entire life. And that was the book he reads. I was, so, I was in awe. Um, I think over time they will come to term. Um, it's a gradual process and through this past few weeks, it's starting to happen finally. So I'm glad, I'm glad to see, and I'm excited to see how they will go down this rabbit hole themselves. Love that. Well done. Well done. Yeah. It's funny eh? with the people that you love the most, you need the most patience also, right? Like you, you want them to, to get it, understand it, study it, all the, all these things. But, uh, yeah, I agree with what you said before. You cannot really rush. I think rushing it or being overly trying to get them into it is actually adverse to what you're trying to uh, to achieve, right? Totally. Uh, I mean, People get rebellious when they're they're yeah. being told what to do, and yeah. it's we're, we've all been teenagers, um, and this doesn't really go away as human. Like if no. I'm <laughs> if I'm already doing something. And you are telling me to do the same thing. I'm like, oh, do I really want to do that? Because now you're telling me I'm not going to do it anymore, even if I wanted to. So people have this weird psychology. You have to, you have to inspire their curiosity instead of projecting an agenda onto them. Um, and I think like I'm a huge believer in karma and I believe Bitcoin is kind of part of that, uh, kind of cosmically karmatic. So who? Hmm walks on the Bitcoin path and when it's not entirely in our control, even though they're our, they're, they're the person we love the most. It's tied to everything else in their lives to have, have a, a mark, uh, on the calendar where, when and where that's going to happen. And we can only nudge and we can only expedite it. But at the end of the day, we're, um, karmac, karmatically tied to this and everyone has to walk their own path. Yeah, you cannot orange pill other other people, right? Like you you have to do it yourself. Yeah. So you mentioned um, you working now in the Bitcoin space, and that uh, also doing the podcasts. You know, it it gives you a lot of new p- people to like you. You get to know a lot of new people, and you're contributing to it. How do you how do you think Bitcoin fosters this community building? Like why? Why do people want to contribute to it so much and build stuff together? What is your, what's your view on that? I would say it's the people in the community and Bitcoiner 
Bitcoin, Bitcoin needs, Bitcoin doesn't necessarily need you and me, but Bitcoin needs Bitcoiners and we're all Bitcoiners. And I've, my life really started to shift majorly after I started going to Bitcoin conferences. Um, cause before my first Bitcoin conference, it was two years of working a year and a half of working in the actively working in the industry, but with very few Bitcoiners that are actually in my physical real life. And then when I start traveling to Bitcoin events, Bitcoin meetups and conferences, I realized, wow, like these people, they are all here. And I yes. got very surprised. <laughs> yeah. I got very surprised at how same, easy, yeah. how easy to connect with them because you have that base layer of philosophy figure it out. And then you can agree on a lot of the fundamental values you have as, as people that shaped you into who you are, that will allow you to quickly skip over the s small talks when you're, when you're talking to a Bitcoiner and then onto the bigger topics, um, the personal truth and journey and transformation very, very quickly, like within the three minute conversation, you'll, you'll find yourself talking about your life stories and your struggles. And, um, for me, that's magic. I love how I love connecting with people. I've always been curious about people and big winners are, are the most, are the best people I've known. I would say, well, not everybody, but on average as a community, big winners are so interesting. They're so audacious in terms of the life decisions that they make. Um, they have a lot of courage and strengths and strong work ethics and very free thinking and nomadic. Like these things I love about people in, in general. And I find a lot of them. So, and every time I travel to these conferences or events, I seem to find lifetime connections, which is, you don't see it in any other communities. Um, plus when I go to Bitcoin conferences, there's no light in the women's bathroom. So that's always, <laughs> that, that's did always you know, a plus. <laughs> yeah. Did you, did you know you value these things beforehand or is this something that you discovered by apparently becoming a Bitcoiner and then also meeting other Bitcoin? I would, I would say Bitcoin solidified these qualities like i've always been a freedom maximalist I, I was born and raised in china and then i left at 18 years old and basically have been on my own for my entire adulthood and that felt like a very good privilege it was such a privilege to have the opportunity to navigate through your life on the dots when you hit ad adulthood um and then really take responsibilities of these choices because then you you have no one to rely on you if you don't care if i don't care nobody cares and i really have to protect myself and take care of myself throughout these years and that's already part of bitcoin ethos of personal sovereignty because i have to great grow a brain of my own um, to not getting taken advantage of, to not get tricked into situations or to just in general protect myself and have the best experience that I can possibly have on my own. Um, and then the freedom aspect, I've always been a freedom maximalist. I love freedom. It's one of my core motivations, I would say, to be free. And it's, I was tweeting about this the other day. It's to be free. It's someone's it's, it's the biggest ambition that one can ever have. And it really is. Um, and to this day, if you ask me, like, what do I want to do? It's, it's not really necessarily what I want to do is what I want to do. So I, so I get to feel free It's the freedom. That's the core driver and whatever I do, whatever I discover that give me that feeling, give me that freedom, then I'm into it. Um, so I would say having Bitcoin in my life definitely solidified a lot of these values that I already had and brought them onto the surface and allowed me to really live, um, live those qualities to keep me accountable, um, each day to, to continue this path, even though it's not easy sometimes. Yeah. It's funny while you're talking, I'm also reflecting on how that, how that went for me, but I think for me, it was, I, I think I realized what I found found important when I also saw it in other people and was like, 
oh, interesting. These people share the same ideas or the same values, right? So uh, I think that strengthens, again, kind of that belief in yourself or the trust in yourself, right? Like that's what I think, uh, how how something should work or, you know, whatever, what what value I um you know, should hold or operate or live, live by, right? That you, the fact that you see that as in other people, that they are also a mirror for you, I think is also a very positive, um, effect of actually g- also going to, uh, that's what I wanted to talk about Bitcoin conferences. I only went to two, but I had this feeling exactly as, as you said, I, I, I went to a conference. I was in the back of a room. First, first room I went to my first conference, first presentation. I was like, these people are all into the same thing. That's wild. <laughs> you know, like just realizing that it's not like a digital internet game or only Twitter, right? There's real, there's real people that uh, actually come out to these things. It's re- actually really refreshing because I, I grew up in big cities and I didn't grow up having essentially any community and community. It's, it's a word. It's a very like English word. Uh, it, well, it's, it's English word that gets used a lot in, in different contexts, but community, it's not something that like in, in Chinese, we don't really use it a lot. And I grew up in big cities where we talk to the neighbor that's directly next door to us, but that's, that's it. And I didn't grow up with, um, local community that's tight enough. Um, and I didn't necessarily grow up with, with nature either. So when I come to Bitcoin, um, and enter this community knowing more people and then feel welcomed. It's, it's a new and really fresh experience for me. And in a way, it was the very first time that I feel, oh, wow, we share something together and we build things together and we're walking, working towards the same vision to build a better world with these hard kinded, hard working, and just in general, really cool people. And I get to be a part of it. Like, doesn't, does that make me cool? Like, does that make me, uh, working on something that fulfill my own soul and my own purpose? Like, I started to think about these questions through the lens of community because it, th- that perspective wasn't available to us, to me previously. Yeah. So do you think something like a Bitcoin culture exists? And if so, what? What does it consist of? I think it does exist, but I don't know if it's going to exist forever. Just like we have Bitcoin job, like now we have Bitcoin job and that means working in Bitcoin industry, but we don't have internet jobs anymore because everyone's job nowadays have an aspect of using the internet. So we don't specify that these are internet jobs. These are just jobs. I think Bitcoin will be the same that in in years time, hopefully, uh, sooner than we think, every company will have a Bitcoin element. Either it's through their strategic reserve or in their daily conduct or in its, its mean of payment that they, they, they accept. It's going to be part of their business um, no matter what. So everyone just working in general um, with with bitcoin in in that picture but i do think bitcoin culture is extremely prominent right now and it should be discussed more because we are still in the adoption phase and we're very early and like i shared that most people that are currently bitcoiners they're it's likely they're either into economics or technology but I came in the space not knowing much about either and I still became a bitcoiner and that made me think there's so many people that are just like me who previously thought that Bitcoin is not for them, but they're, it's, it's not true. And if we think about the, the current set of Bitcoiners and the current, currently available content in Bitcoin because of the demographic, of course, they're going to talk about and because we're the, the market condition we're in and then the socioeconomic condition we're in with Bitcoin. Like, of course, a lot of the effort and topics will go to how we can push Bitcoin adoption more mainstream through politics, through economics, um, through technology. But we're kind of missing out on the, on the human aspect of it, like how people um, transform through it, how we're seeing 
art, music. Um, seeing all these different form of expression coming out because of Bitcoin and for Bitcoin, these are extremely important to to uncover. Um, and we're seeing more and more people that are paying attention to this. So that was part of the reason why I started the Life with Bitcoin podcast, where the Bitcoin is not where Bitcoin is not necessarily the subject in in the show. It's the context where we get together about to talk about almost everything but Bitcoin, like it's a place where we talk about your personal story and that can include trauma, um, include truths, and that include God, music, creativity, relationships, like all these things that we go through, not because we're Bitcoiners, but because we're humans. And the, the idea here is that for people who are not yet into Bitcoin, but they're curious, then they are, if they tune into the show and, th- and see, oh, this group of people called Bitcoiners and whatever that means, whatever that means, there's, they seem to be a good group of people that live with more freedom, live with more connection. They're, they seem to be healthier and happier and more loved and more fulfilled. And I wonder what's up with them. Cause I want to be that. I don't necessarily care about Bitcoin, but if I want that life and this, these Bitcoiners achieve that state through Bitcoin, I'm going to look into it because I want to live that life. It's basically what influencers are selling, right? They look nice and they yeah. look healthy and it's not the product they're selling, it's the image, it's the vision. Um, I think Bitcoin has the potential to do the same. We just need to have more educators or creators um, shift focus more on the cultural, the personal side of Bitcoin and um, make it entertaining, like make it engaging and entertaining and fun. And I like to borrow, um, internet Sophie's, um, way of saying this to really make Bitcoin fun, sexy, and cool. And that's what she tries to do with her music as well. So there are a lot of creators that are actively doing this work. So I'm sure that, um, more and more people will get onboarded onto the Bitcoin standard, not through the depressing social economic conditions we're in, but through the hope, through the positivity um, and the love and connection it brings um, and the incredible art that comes with um, the the mindset and with all of these very hardworking people that embody the philosophy of proof of work um, that actively contribute to the, to the community. Yeah. I, I, I love how you talk about this. I think, um, this is also probably the, these are probably also the best, you know, the touch points that we talked about before. These are probably those touch points, right? I think it's about how is someone living his life and, and, uh, how, how did they get there is kind of like the second question, right? The, yeah. the where you're at or how you view life is more important than kind of how you got there that comes after that yeah yeah i love that you took that approach so what with the people that you you talk to now right what have been some of the biggest insights or or things that you learned from your guests guests like what what was inspirational to yourself right um well there are so so many examples I'll, I'll share two one of one is the most recent one and one is a really profound one um one, the most recent interview I did was with Captain Sid from Rite of Passage. Um, Evan Raleigh is, is his real name. So he holds, um, experience program in Thailand where he recruits, uh, he does, he's been doing this once a year so far and he recruits motorcyclists to come to Thailand from all across the world in small, in a small group. They will travel through Thailand and, and travel through these places that not usual tour- tourists would go and make it a transforming experience. And he was saying how his program is for people who are going through kind of major life changes and AKA existential crisis, basically have gone through a divorce or sold their business for entire life and things like that. So life changes um, to change people's perspective and to really travel, to kind of throw you in situations where you just have no clue and then have you emerge uh, with that. And he was, we were, we were talking about fear and he said as a motorcyclist, sometimes the, the wheel get triggered. And then if you hit something and then the, the 
the handle will start to wiggle. So the whale and the hand handle will start to wiggle. And if you, your natural instinct, because you're in fear, that your natural instinct will be to grab that handle and then to stabilize it. But if you do that, you're, you're like, there's a chance you're dead on the spot because that's when you interfere with how the, the vehicle can stabilize by itself. So he had one of these situations where the, the bike was wobbling and it was high speed. And then he let the, he really made a counterintuitive decision to not act on fear. And then the bike wobbled for two seconds uh, and then kind of went straight on, on its own. But if he had grabbed it, he would have just dead on be dead on the spot. And this goes to show that sometimes our fear is limiting. It's our fear that's limiting us. And if we act on fear, that's when we're going to get killed. Um, so really have to push against that natural instinct and don't let our fear trick ourselves. So that was a really valuable lesson that I learned recently. And then the other right. one I would share is with my uh interview with um irene crawford she's a death doula so you know the the birth doula and then they guide you through birthing that's the whole the whole yeah. journey so she's a death doula um provide um this service to people who are dying and their family and she told me a, a mantra is that today is a good day to die so after i talked to her i practice this mantra almost daily to the uh, because when i practice this and tell myself today is a good day to die. If I feel at peace, if I feel okay, like I can live with that. I can, you know, I, I wouldn't mind. It means I'm, I'm walking the right path. It means I'm, I'm living my life to the full extent and I have no regret and I can yeah. just go anytime. But some days I would feel iffy. Some days I practice mantra and I feel, oh, I don't really want to die today because it's not a good day to die. Then that's a good indicator of that I'm doing something wrong in my life, that I need to change something about myself to get back to that peaceful state when I practice this mantra. So that's a really powerful thing I've learned from my guest. But there are so many examples of these nuanced um, lessons um, that I personally benefit a lot from. So I encourage you to check it out. There might be some people that you are interested in. They're, they're experience can really inspire or give you that extra nudge to take actions. Yeah. I will of course link to the podcast in the show notes. So everyone should, uh, should check it out. Do you see any patterns emerging? Are there, are there like overlapping insights bet between, uh, the people also because they adopted Bitcoin? I would say yes. I would say yes. It's, um, in a way, it's almost like this, the same thing repeated over, over, over again, but for the better, because for different people, different message, different message work and different story work. And maybe you have to hear it from someone who have, who share similar similarities with you to really make it work. Um, one of the commonality that I realized is that when people set them up, set themselves up for radical life changes, they have no clue. <laughs> they have no clue. It's it's not like they have everything planned out, A, B, C, D, E, this mm. is my plan, and I'm executing that and I'm I'm a success. No, like everybody is clueless, just as clueless as you, and just as clueless as yes. me. Um yes. and when it really comes down to that leap of faith. Every every single guest I talk to they've done something that are kind sometimes they've done something that are really radical to our average person's eye but they they did it not because they have everything figured out it's because they really want to do it to the point that i'm just going to start before i know how and see how it goes start with the first step without knowing what the second step is and then just figure it out when you're there that's a really valuable mentality to to have to achieve anything and then to have any uh adventures i would say and people in general have to even if they start off as perfectionists they really have to get rid of that mentality on their whatever journey they're on to uh, maximize their experience to be open-minded for more learnings and experience um and growth um and to really, to take that leap of faith and fly from there. That's a commonality I'm seeing across pretty much all of my guests. Do you think that's then enabled by Bitcoin? 
also the the like the, the the inviting that uncertainty into your life and trying these things is also something that you could create right i would say bitcoin uh, the, there are several roles bitcoin can be playing here the first role from a from a, a logistics standpoint because bitcoiners have sound money they can put their life saving into bitcoin knowing that it's going to store its value over time if we huddle properly so to have a sound money to fall back on as a saving device it's a extremely reassuring thing and that can take a, take away a lot of the pressure and anxiety of inflation of of what we experience with inflation and the uncertainty of um our money how our money would perform over the next decade or so so that provides peace of mind logistically and then philosophically um we as bitcoiners we embrace the the value of things like proof of work and being a low time preference and these two things I'd, I'd say contribute really fundamentally contribute to people making these decisions once they've adapted bitcoin is that they understand i'm looking super long term like ask what i what i do i really want to work my fiat job or live this life that i'm miserable in in 10 years 30 years i know that going somewhere else radical would be super scary but that provides opportunity for me to not do this in 10 years down the line and then i'm gonna go for it it's, it's you have to think that with low time preference to really think far ahead to endure the discomfort today uh so the the low time preference is one thing that's super important and then the proof of work thing is also very important is that now you know if i make this make this jump if i put in the work it's gonna show it's gonna show it's not going to be about who has the it's so proof of stake and proof of work like how i usually explain the difference of the two is that proof of work is you studied really hard and then you get good grades on a, a test and then proof of stake is it's it's kind of like saying whoever has the most fancy stationery gets the best mark and when big winners adopt the proof of work mindset <laughs> then then we understand that if we put in the work to study we are going to get good grades and it's not going to be about having fancy stationery anymore and we don't have to get started with all of the fancy gears and we can just go through a very minimalistic route and just let the work shine through itself um this is i i would say another another mental switch would help um us taking radical decisions and just be patient and be that one percent better each day. Yeah. Do you see also any spiritual implications in the rise of Bitcoin? I do, and this is oh, this is actually one of the common or the or the similarities I'm finding through interviewing Bitcoiners is that this past six months, especially, the topic of God has come up a lot. Sometimes um, I've interviewed a Bitcoiner who's um, we've kind of made that uh episode of the conversation about religion in general because he made a decision to become a christian in his 30s and that went like that process went through years uh, and then we were talking about that process but after that there were more and more conversations with bitcoiners on the show and they were like god had an influence on me i've developed a relationship god with god and sometimes before bitcoin sometimes after bitcoin but i'm starting to the 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 collection of of god and bitcoin start to have more and more overlap um at least from my observation and that's super interesting very interesting yeah i don't think i am personally there but i think i in the christianity way but i think as you just mentioned a while back and i absolutely think the same is you know the the most important questions for us all to figure out together is where do we come from why are we here what's the the purpose of this finite life right what am i here to do what am i here to contribute like the, the big questions right you I, I think true bitcoin this is my explainer for what you just said but this is just my personal experience like true bitcoin the fact that you can own your time more and be more conscious about what you spend your time on, whatever interests you, 
at least in my experience, it draws me to these questions. Right. I think it, 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 they are the ultimate questions for any curious um, person. Right. And so it's not a surprise to me, actually, that this is your answer. Right. Because God or, you know, whoever or whatever you think is God. Right. Is somewhere in that realm, a, a topic in that realm of questions. And only when you have the time to reflect and research and discuss and whatever. That's when you make the conscious decision to actually focus on these questions and, and, and that topic. Um, so I think it's, it doesn't surprise me that this is the answer because I have a similar experience. I think, uh, yeah, I think it's interesting and that's how I would explain it. But what's your idea about it? Is it that you just have more time and you get drawn towards these questions or is there something else? Um, that a hundred percent because the, you, when you are finally outside of the survival mode 24 seven, then your consciousness actually get elevated. And I feel like Bitcoiners on average are Bitcoiners consciousness is elevated on average to even get the concept of Bitcoin. And that kind of goes back to that self selection process where you have to take that personal responsibility first before you can even be open to Bitcoin. And you have to be, you have to be open-minded enough to even have the potential to drop your ego and have that ego best that we talk about in the process of rabbit hole. Um, so it's a self-selection process, Bitcoiners. I would say it's a group of people who are highly, who are more spiritual on average, who are more philosophical on average. Um, and we're equipped to buy proper money. Now we're finally can allow ourselves to enter the mind space of, of, of even asking this question in the first place, just like when we asked what is money for the first time. Um, and yeah. we all know like what happened to us after asking that question. Um, so the, the new set of question that Bitcoin allow us to ask, we're, we'll just kind of enter a, a open, open up a new realm of consciousness for us to explode and gods in it. So that's, that's my hypothesis. Um, I'm only on this journey myself. So, um, I guess if you ask me in a year's time, my answer would be somewhat different, but it's, it's for the better because there's, yeah. I can't know, right? It's, it's better not to know. Yeah. Yeah. So do you believe Bitcoin has the potential to drive significant social change in countries worldwide what's your view on that i think we're already seeing a lot of the social changes happening because of bitcoin well maybe not on a not on a larger scale that are immediately available to us because there's the world's big and so much information but there's so many community projects community builders that are starting from their immediate neighborhood they're starting from their immediate community to bring this positive change um, to shift their own frequency into a better reality so that more people will join along um, and then we eventually all end up in that better world. Um, so I think the social changes are already happening, but they may not be visible to us just yet um, or they may not be vis visible to all of all of us just yet. Um, we just need to uh, keep building and be patient and get up even when we feel like we don't want to um when we are doubting ourselves having imposter syndrome questioning am i making a difference you are definitely making a difference um just keep going and just keep going this is something that i've received um recently and that gave me a lot of gave me a lot of comfort and strength i would say because sometimes i would be like oh am i am I using my time wisely? Is this really making a difference? And then I hear just keep going. Then I kind of remain centered and grounded again and focus on the work instead of the, the guilt or the imposter syndrome. Yeah. 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 Again, I have the exact same experience. Very interesting to hear that from, from someone else too. And do you think this is then like, I sometimes think about it like this, right? You studied Bitcoin. You understand it, you, you verified it, right? I mean, you built conviction through understanding, not because someone else told you, you know, this is buy this thing or get into this thing. Like you did the work yourself. That's the entire point. 
then you are invited to contribute to it, you know, in, in, in whatever way. Do you feel like this is like a giant manifestation experiment? As you said, don't stop, keep talking about it, right? As long as we keep doing that, Bitcoin is actually inevitable in that sense. Totally. I, I'm a big fan of manifestation. Like I talk about it with my guests on the show and we, we try to figure out the methodology of around it. Um, and I was, um, so I, I, this is something that I'm interested in a lot and I would a hundred percent, I feel like Bitcoin is just kind of self fulfilling prophecy almost like, and, and this is, and people attacked Bitcoin for the same reason. <laughs> That is, it's a self, um, but, but it's, it's okay. It's okay. And if we, if we think about it, parallel universes already is, exist in the sense that we cannot change the, the environment around us. We can only regulate ourselves, either our emotions or actions or how we're managing our time and energy. Um, if we want to travel to an alternate universe, what we need to do is just to match our own frequency to the our frequency in that universe so if you want to be healthy if you want to be healthy and eat what a healthy person would eat if you want to be fit live like a healthy person if live like a fit person like go to go do workouts when they do workouts and go do exercises in the way that they do because you're not gonna get what you want just by sit at home and, and wish for it to, to happen. And this is why a lot of people are, what a lot of people are wrong about manifestation. Manifestation is not daydreaming. It's not about just make a wish and hope it come true. It's about, it's about having faith that this is the path and actually walk that path. There, there are two steps. You have to have yes. really yes. firm belief that it's going to work out no matter what. Um, have the firm belief that you're the main character in your story. You take control of how the story will go. Um, there is a happy ending. You have to believe it without any doubt and to walk the path. And you have to walk the path too. To, but you have to do this at this, do these two things at the same time. Because if you only have the face and don't do anything, then of course nothing will change. But if you just walk the path and be so fixated on the path itself and doubt yourself, then if you don't believe it will happen, then it's guaranteed it's not going to happen. Cause you, if you don't believe it's your, this is going to happen, then your, your action will be consciously and subconsciously alternated to a reality that it won't happen but if yeah. you believe it well then there is no path there exactly is no path. and i was talking yeah. um so a few a um, couple weeks ago i was i rewatched matrix the the first one and one of the scene really stuck with me is when uh, morpheus took neil to see the oracle in the matrix and the oracle was telling neil that you're not the one you're not the one who saved the world Morpheus thinks you, you are, but you're not him. And, but after that, after that, right after that, she also said, but Neil, I know you're not someone who believes in fate. You're not someone who believes that your, your life path is determined. And then you, you're someone who want to make out for your own reality. And then like Neil went out to the world knowing that he's not the one, but through his actions, through the, the sheer will of trying to save his friend, he eventually become the, the person. So it's hard to say that if, if Oracle knew it at first and just kind of manipulated him a little bit so that he can actually walk the path, or it's the, the sheer will that Neil has made him that person that he was not supposed to be. And that paradox interests me. Um, and if we become our own Oracle and say, this is the thing that I want to do. I'm going to do it no matter what. Then, and then you're willing to, to do, you want it enough and willing to work for it. Then it's likely you're going to make it just because you're, you're self fulfilling your own prophecy and Bitcoin. It's, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. And if enough people believe that and match the frequency of Bitcoin goes to a million, it's going to, it can go a million tomorrow. It can happen. Yeah. I think the matrix example, uh, my understanding of it is that, uh, that is more like a test, right? So if she would say, 
yes, you are the one, then he wouldn't do the work. Then someone else created the path or the end state, basically, right? And by telling him you're not the one, it's more of like a test to see, am I actually not the one, right? So it's kind of this uh, psychological trick that, that, that you mentioned, <laughs> mentioned before. I think it's more like that. Like it's, it's the same. Uh, I think that's, a, that's also a good, a good circle that we just walk to, to round, to round this up. I think it's the same. It's the start thinking for yourself, start creating your own path, start walking your own path, right? St you have to get to that destination, right? That's why the advice is study Bitcoin, not buy Bitcoin. Exactly. You know? And, and we talked about these touch points, like why should you study Bitcoin? Well, because hopefully, Maybe in your podcast, maybe in my podcast, maybe in other podcasts or content that you consume, there are people that you identify with in whatever way possible. Um, and they give you a touch point that makes you curious. And that is the first brick of your path, right? The first tile on your path to, you know, where, wherever this ends up. I think we are still on the path, right? Um, yeah, I think we are kind of full circle then in this uh, conversation, don't you think? Totally. Yeah, that's nice. I like, I like, it's nice and nice Very and neat. Cool. Yeah. That's nice. All right. But I still have to ask you the last question because I ask everyone the same question at the end. And that is, what is a core belief that you will never let go? Right. Um, a core belief that I'll never let go. I have many core beliefs that I will never let go, but I'll, I'll, I'll say this one here is the, the, is one sentence is this too shall pass. So why, why this too shall pass in good times? I remind myself this too shall pass to try to seek eternity in fleeting moments and really cherish what's right in front of me. So it helps me to be more present and be more grateful for uh, whatever situation I'm in when, when time is good and when time is bad and I'm really suffering, let's say, then I also say this, this too shall pass to remind myself that it's, it's temporary and to think about how I can transform this grief or sorrow or situation into something more positive, more productive and more meaningful. Um, so this is a mantra that I remind myself in both good and bad times and in boring times too, um, to remind myself to be, to be present and to, um, always seek for, for more love, more connection, more freedom from wherever I'm standing it's because this too shall pass. And we are, um, time is traveling through us, um, in, in a way. And it's, it's really about having that awareness and taking ownership of our time, our life and where are we going and become our own person. And I think it's, it's, it's a huge responsibility, but it's such a, such an opportunity and privilege to, to be that person and really shape your own life in a way that you want, you wish, you hope for, um, through with the help of Bitcoin. And we're so lucky for that. And, um, yeah, super, super grateful for this conversation as well. Thank you for uh, all the questions. Me too. This was really great. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for your time. I also really, really enjoyed it. And uh, we'll stay in touch. Maybe we'll see each other at the next uh, Bitcoin conference. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, check out some of my other episodes to learn why Bitcoin is the most important subject you must understand and adopt. If you want, you can follow and connect with me on Twitter X. I'm at Bram K, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you have any feedback or questions, just reach out. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for our next episode. Thanks for listening.